Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer for the invitation. So this is really a collaborative effort between uh, laboratory experiments going on at uh, UCLA, uh, DNS, direct numerical simulations by Stefan Stelmark, and um, an asymptotically reduced model derived by the Colorado group to work in this uh, limit of vanishingly small Ekman number or vanishingly small uh, Rossby number. And we're trying to see how well these three techniques overlap uh, in terms of describing the problem of uh, rotating really Bernard convection. So uh, I think we've heard much about this in the earlier talks. Basically, when we're looking at planetary interiors, we know these are extreme <coughs> objects as described by the non-dimensional parameters. Rossby numbers small, so they're very strongly rotationally constrained. Reynolds numbers are high, so they're, they're indeed turbulent. And this makes this a prohibitively uh, expensive numerical challenge uh, for those of us doing direct numerical simulations. And we know they're, uh, they're very important in, in many features, such as the geodynamo or, or generating large-scale zonal flows. Um, we've also heard that, you know, due to the rapid rotation, uh, the strong uh, proudman taylor constraints that forces the uh, onset of convection to happen in, in uh, columnar form, as described by the wave number and Ekman number, Ekman to the minus one-third, or um, uh, length scales, horizontal length scales that uh, are proportional to the vertical length scales as Ekman to the one-third. Uh, in rotating convection, and even in geodynamo problems where we see uh, classic, uh, where we're looking at generation of magnetic fields, we're actually, this is a paper by uh, Bruce Buffett and Eric King, uh, showing that you're still seeing this sort of uh, Ekman to the one-third uh, scaling. Um, problematic here is that, you know, these column of flows have been uh, used or, or inferred to sort of describe sort of magnetic features that happen in the geodynamo, such as uh, high latitude uh, flux patches, basically. But when you look at the scaling theories of the current uh, Ekman numbers being employed in these models, you know, yes, they can get the correct sort of scales of a, you know, order of 100 or 1,000 kilometers, basically. But when you go to Earth-like parameters of 10 to the minus 15, uh, you're, getting, you're getting columns that are vanishingly small, okay, and not not even to the eye. I've just put this in on the slide just to sort of show the difference between this and what's sort of done in current geodynamo models. So there's a problem in sort of scale, uh, scale separation. So this diagram sort of, sort of describes the, uh, the parameter regime and the challenges. So I'll just go through this very quickly. We know where the geodynamo problem works. It's sort of limited in Ekman number and limited in, in, in uh, Reynolds number as well. This is a very challenging problem when we do this in spherical objects. So one needs to simplify. In, in our study, we take out the magnetic field. We're just going to consider rotating flows. And even a further sim simplification, especially done in the lab, is just to look at really Bernard convection, the layer of fluid heated from below and cool from above, but rapidly rotating. This is sort of the parameter regime where the UCLA group operates, basically. So yes, they can push this to higher Reynolds number, but based on the limited heat flux, they can put th uh, put, uh, get through the problem, they're actually limited in, in terms of the, uh, the lower Rayleigh numbers or, or, or Reynolds numbers they can achieve in the experiment. This sort of led to uh, uh, in invoking some DNS by Stefan Stillmark, basically. So still in the same regime, can't potentially get to so high Reynolds numbers, basically, but we can get to uh, from onset up to the highest sort of achievable, achievable Reynolds numbers in the flow, but still these flows are sort of limited by uh, um, uh, low, moderately low, uh, uh, large Ekman numbers, and that's just due to the fast waves and trying to resolve things like Ekman boundary layers in the problem. These are very challenging, ch challenging issues. So, and I think Paul Roberts was talking about this. Basically, if you're at these sort of Ekman numbers and you're trying to extrapolate into planetary settings, basically that you know, can be a uh, pause for caution, basically. So the, the, our general idea is, well, are there, we know, at least in the atmospheric and oceanographic, oceanographic communities, are there models that can work in the, in the limit of low, vanishingly small Ekman numbers and vanishingly small uh, uh, Rossby numbers? And we contend yes, because we've derived some, and I'll describe these for you right now. So we're looking at reduced PDE models. So no time to sort of go through the derivations, but I'll just tell you some of the features of the PDE model. Um, 
It's based on uh, an asymptotic expansion of, the uh, of all the variables for the Navier-Stokes equation in terms of Rossby number and the primary uh, balance that we find, as <coughs> we heard magnetostrophic, but in this case, in the no magnetic fields, we're going to have geostrophy, so point-wise geostrophy at each, at each point in the fluid, pressure is the stream function, uh, leading order, horizontal non-convergence, basically, and this is the vorticity field. Now, of course, geostrophy is not an exact balance, basically. At small Rossby numbers, there is an asymptotically small departures, and if you follow the standard procedures of perturbation theory, one can derive how, uh, how, these, how, this, how, how this balance is broken, and these are the equations that we derive through this method. So just to explain, there's four equations, of ver equation for uh, evolving the vertical vorticity, equation for vertical velocity, temperature anomalies, and the mean temperature equation. What's special about this model, uh, due to, we, we invoke anisotropy of the fluid, and due to that, we have very small vertical diffusion, and that filters out, allows for the filtering of Ekman layers, no need to resolve those. And again, another consequence of the anisotropy is that uh, we also filter what we call fast inertial waves. So these are uh, very nice features numerically for time step in the PDE, and once we've had, once we've got this PDE that evolves <coughs> uh, these fluid variables in this set, uh, we ask, what can it do? Notice that there's no Ekman number or Rossby number in these equations. There were the, they, these were the expansion parameters, so they've been removed from the problem. The, buoyant, the uh, radian number always appears in this reduced form and, and in this combination. So that's, we have a control parameter of the radian number and the Prandtl number in the problem. So two questions that we're going to ask about the laboratory experiments, the DNS, and the reduced models. One, let's look at the flow morphologies. What are the flows that one can achieve in this rapidly rotating environment? So with the model, we performed a suite of simulations, basically in the same setting that Selina said, heated from below, cool from above, uh, uh, periodic in the horizontal. We varied the Prandtl number, and we varied the reduced Rayleigh number. On this side here, here's the criticality of the fluid, and we tried to observe what kind of flow morphologies occurred in the fluid here. And then we, we observed four. Um, classically, just above onset, well-known sort of cellular flows first uh, derived by Veronis. Uh, as we move on, um, we find that you know, we develop these thermal bound we develop thermal boundary layers in the fluid, and we got this surprise state where the thermal boundary layers become unstable, emitting both cyclonic and anticyclonic plumes. These plumes descend in and actually synchronize to form these stable convective Taylor columns, which are very good at uh, transporting heat top to bottom, basically. As we increase the radian number further, uh, uh, Synchronizations of thermal boundary layer are, are thinner, so synchronizations are, is harder, so we get these sort of intermittent columns and we call these the plume state. And finally, the, f the ultimate state we find in the fluid is one Celine has been talking to, has talked about, basically, is that the p once the plumes are gone, basically, we just have a turbulent uh, geostrophic interior. So again, here's a flow that is uh, in everywhere, everywhere in this flow is in point-wise geostrophic balance, basically. And one of the surprising features here, which is uh, <coughs> the, the conserved quantities for these equations is just the energy. Entropy is not a conserved quanti quantity. And we see this uh, inverse cascade uh, to, to a large-scale vortex pair in the box. And whatever the size of the box, basically, and the, the cascade uh, produces this barotropic vortex, which coexist with the vigorous convection at the large, at the large scales. So those are the sort of the flow morphologies that we see in, in, in the problem. And the question is, how well does that do when we compare it to, um, to uh, DNS and the laboratory experiments? So we set out on this problem with John and uh, Arno and Stefan Stelmark, basically, where John at Prandtl number seven has performed some experiments, and Stefan has also performed a bunch of uh, DNS experiments reduced into the parameters of the model, so the reduced Rayleigh number, which is Rayleigh number times Ekman to the minus four thirds, or times Ekman to the plus four thirds, basically, and they basically dropped some points and performed simulations and experiments in there. And this diagram over here basically shows that you know it's doing a very good job, basically. So the free slip comparison for the reduced model and the DNS model basically showed almost a one-to-one -one comparison in terms of the flow morphology for the parameters in this, in, this, in this parameter space. Of course, in the experiments, there are no slip boundary conditions. There are Ekman layers. Basically, Stefan has performed that, compared it with John, found very similar uh, flow morphologies. And all in all, 
whether it's no slip or free slip, basically, when, these, when we cross these boundaries, basically the experiments, the DNS and the, the asymptotic model are showing uh, this similar flow, flow morphologies, basically. So at this stage, it looks like even with no slip boundaries, there's not, there's not a, a, the Ekman layers are a sort of secondary, of secondary importance. And Stefan shows this, basically, he goes into the DNS model, he actually looks at a profile in the Ekman layer, and basically shows that it, it's actually a linear, it's a linear, classical linear Ekman layer, basically. So that basically said to Stefan and us, basically, we can parameterize the Ekman layer, even in the DNS model, by using the pumping boundary condition, basically. So that gets rid of the need to resolve the Ekman layers, which is a very, very uh, stiff numerical constraint. And Stefan, indeed, has, has done that. Okay, so the second thing we did, we looked at heat, heat transport, which is a, a more quanti uh, quantitative measurements that the, the experiments can produce. And uh, there we found some surprises, basically. So on the left plot here, we have Nusselt number, non-dimensional heat transport versus the reduced Rayleigh number. And this is a, a, a comparison between the reduced model and the DNS with stress-free. So the colored is the, is, is the DNS and the, the open, the, the gray shade is what we, we produce from the uh, asymptotic model. And by, by and large, a uh, very good uh, quantitative agreement. As we get to larger Rayleigh numbers, the DNS model is sort of breaking this ros uh, the rotational constraint in the fluid and there's a little uh, disagreement up there. But the surprise was, of course, with the experiments and the DNS, when we put uh, no slip boundary conditions, there's just an order one departure from what the asymptotic model is doing and what the DNS model is doing. And the only difference in this problem is, in fact, the Ekman, the Ekman boundary layers. This is, this is, this, they must have uh, a, 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 an order one uh, effect on the model. So the central question here is that as Ekman number goes to zero, are we seeing convergence to the asymptotic model or divergence, and this was an ongoing debate within the, the collaborative effort. So Stefan did the following, uh, just focus on the left curve here of Nusselt versus Rayleigh. He actually, uh, this, this curve here is a DNS experiment performed at Prandtl number seven, both with uh, no slip boundaries and both with the parameterized Ekman pumping boundary condition, basically, and they lie right on top of each other. So that's basically showing that the pumping boundary conditions are doing a very good job in modeling the effect of no slip boundaries and is relaxed numerical constraint. But again, we're showing that they're very far off from stress-free. In the second plot here, uh, Stefan is actually, uh, has, has varied the Ekman number, so he, he starts decreasing the Ekman number, and it's going the wrong way, in the sense that there's no convergence to the stress-free model, uh, it's going the other way. So this is sort of suggesting that you know, Ekman numbers have an order one effect on, uh, 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 pumping has an order one effect on, on, on the heat transport, as opposed to the flow morphology where the, all the flows in the bulk essentially, essentially look the same. So this just led us to do the same thing here. Basically, we can augment the reduced model by putting in pumping boundary conditions. That should be a one there. Uh, that, you know, pumping boundary conditions. So, and then we can also by, we also find that we must also include a, a, a boundary layer in the in the thermal fluctuations. This is well known. This has been seen in earlier work by uh, Nyler and Bishop, basically, and, and, and uh, Zhang and Roberts in their studies of uh, Ekman boundary layers within the thermal convective problem. Basically, so we do this. So this is just preliminary where we have, we are, we are simulating these results, but something we can do very, very quickly if I, uh, <clears throat> is that we can look at a special class of solutions to that model. So it turns out when we have, we choose special plan forms, basically there are uh, fully nonlinear solutions that we can follow to arbitrary reduced Rayleigh number, and we call these a the single mode model. And this is what we have here, basically. So we are doing Nusselt versus Rayleigh. The dark curve is showing what we get out of the, with no pumping boundary conditions here. And as we increase the Ekman number or, uh, there, we show the effect of heat transport on the Ekman number. And you can see this is given the order one departures from, uh, for very small Ekman numbers from, uh, <coughs> from the, from the stress-free calculation. I've kind of plotted it, you know, shift all of these curves to, to here just to show that it's peeling off, basically. So the smaller the Ekman number, it goes for a while tracking the stress-free, and then there's departure. So the central question here is that, is that uh, an effect that is lasting, a lasting effect? So we can do some theory, no, not, no, no time to explain it basically, but the reduced model is bounded 
by this Ekman number, and we can find a transitional, we can find a transitional Ekman number by which the pumping becomes very important in heat transport. This is what it is for the DNS Ekman number 10 to the minus 7. We pick a threshold of this, which is below critical onset, so it happens almost immediately, if you recall from those uh, the curves that we saw this. And as you go up to sort of Earth core parameters, basically, we get a reduced rate number about 46.4. You know, 46.4. That happens in the cellular regime before we have a transition to uh, columnar convection. So um, I know I have a just a few moments left, basically, but uh, the idea is now, basically, here's what John can do in his experiments uh, here. We have, we're pushing on, uh, the reduced model lives over here, basically. It's still hard to solve. We have to push the Rayleigh number up to try and get into those regimes, but that's ongoing work, basically. And perhaps some of the things that Celine talked about, inverse cascades to large-scale flows may have some, uh, uh, mean, uh, some, some impact on, uh, on flux patches. So I'll let you read my summary, and I thank you very much for listening. Time for one quick question. Yeah.